Dr. Larson and I would like to recognize the Colgan families for being here. We want to thank you for your advocacy. You want to thank you for being involved and making a difference, and we're very pleased that you're here today. Um, I ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing to offer testimony and to ask questions uh, without objection, so ordered. Today, we look forward to hearing from the Department of Transportation, the Government Accountability Office, and industry stakeholders on an important topic to our country, air service to small and rural communities. Airports are vital elements of our nation's infrastructure. They enable millions of passengers to travel through the United States and to the rest of the world. Airports are economic drivers for many communities across the United States, contributing millions of jobs to our economy and generating trillions of dollars in economic input. They serve as staging points for life-saving emergency services, as well as a lifeline to many rural or remote communities. The impact of airports is felt way beyond the tarmac and the terminal. In recent years, smaller airports in the U.S. have, for a variety of reasons, experienced a decrease in air service. The subcommittee is interested in hearing from the witnesses about the federal programs that exist to assist in delivering air service to small and rural communities and how they are being utilized. We're also very interested in hearing about innovative approaches that industry stakeholders from airports to air carriers and to local communities have taken to retain or to be able to increase that service. I am well aware of how important airports are to local communities. In my own district, we have seen an increase in routes bringing new air service to Atlantic City International Airport. Uh, and starting on April 1st, United began, began two new direct routes to Houston and Chicago from Atlantic City. Uh, we believe this level of service is the type of increase that will help local businesses and the economy. As we hear more about the types of successes later, I can tell you that it's not something that just happens overnight. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of coordination on the local level, a true community effort, and the end result is what makes all that hard work worth it. Look forward to hearing from our witnesses and thank them for joining us today. Uh, before I recognize my colleague, Mr. Larson, for his comments, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material for the record of this hearing. Uh, without objection, so ordered, and now I'd like to yield to Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, want to recognize the Colgan families. and Thank you for your continued advocacy to help improve uh, air safety here in the United States. Mr. Chairman, residents of uh, remote small communities across the country connect to national and international aviation system through our smaller airports and the regional carriers that serve them. Air service not only connects these communities to the economy, uh, but serves as a lifeline for emergency services, disaster relief, and delivery of time-sensitive cargo. And as we begin to consider the next FAA reauthorization, today's hearing helps us assess some of these issues and challenges facing a small community air service. In 1978, Congress enacted the Airline Deregulation Act, which phased out the federal government's control over domestic airfares and routes. Since the regulation, airlines have largely been free to decide where to fly, and as a consequence, small communities have struggled to attain and uh, to attract and retain air service. And almost four decades later, air service in the U.S. is, not surprisingly, highly concentrated at the largest airports where routes are more profitable. 88% of passengers, uh, passengers board at 62 large or medium hub airports. Further, in recent years, we've seen a significant airline in industry restructuring, in part as a response to recessions and increasing fuel prices. Since 2005, there have been three mergers involving six major U.S. legacy carriers and greater capacity discipline throughout the industry. There's no doubt that these recent developments have had a major effect on small community service. From 2007 to 2012, roughly 1.4 million yearly scheduled domestic flights have been cut. And during that same time period, the 29 largest airports lost 8.8% of their scheduled domestic flights, while the impact is disproportionate as small, medium, and non-hub airports have lost 21.3% of their scheduled domestic flights. So today, this committee will hear from two airport directors about proactive and innovative steps they have taken in their small communities to attract and retain uh, air service. With these examples of strong local leadership uh, despite these examples of strong local leadership, maintaining a truly national air transportation system does require a sustained federal commitment. 
When Congress deregulated the airlines in 1978, it also recognized that the market alone could not reliably maintain air service to small communities. Therefore, Congress created the Essential Air Service Program, the EAS program, which guaranteed that communities served by carriers before deregulation will continue to receive air service. But we can't have it both ways. We can't support community air service while advocating the elimination of the EAS program. A House passed authorization bill in 2011 would have eliminated the EAS program everywhere except Alaska and Hawaii. And earlier this month, the, the House passed budget doubled down on that policy by ending service to small communities by proposing to phase out the EAS program. Now, Mr. Chairman, you and I have both stated several times in the past few months that we have every intention to craft a bipartisan FAA reauthorization bill. So I hope that in the next reauthorization, efforts to dismantle EAS are a non-starter from the get-go. And I look forward to working with my colleagues from both sides of the aisle to preserve and strengthen this important program that guarantees service to more than 160 small communities across the country. And finally, Mr. Chairman, in 2010, Congress mandated new pilot training, qualification, and work hour rules that have only recently come into effect. Some regional carriers that serve small communities claim they're having difficulty hiring pilots because of these new safety regulations. Just last month, the GAO examined this issue and reported that, in fact, a large pool of qualified pilots exists relative to projected in demand, but whether such pilots are willing or available to work at the wages being offered is unknown. According to the GAO, the average base entry level salary at regional airlines, that at the airlines that examine, equates to approximately $21,600 a year. And according to the Wall Street Journal, um, Great Lakes Airlines, a carrier with the largest presence in the EAS program, offers entry level starting salaries of $16,500 a year. But not surprisingly, Great Lakes claims it's having a hard time hiring new pi uh, pilots and has cut service to a handful of EAS communities. And to date, the Department of Transportation has been successful and finding replacements for most of these communities. But we ought to be clear, Mr. Chairman, that Congress enacted the 2010 safety law to improve safety. However, the investigations in the 2009 Colgan Flight 3407 tragedy revealed the two-tiered airline industry labor structure that was broken. And for over a decade, industry consolidation and cost-cutting at regional airlines led to lower and lower airline pilot pay and a race to the bottom that's destroying the American airline pilot profession. That situation is not sustainable. Moreover I, moreover, I also believe the Department must examine its relationship to EAS carriers that are paying pilots minimum and poverty-level wages. The race to the bottom should not be driven by carriers whose broken business models are sustained largely by federal contracts. Moreover, it's not realistic for the Department to assume that these carriers can provide reliable service when they cannot attract new pilots by offering a livable wage. So these are very tough issues we're facing, Mr. Chairman, but I look forward to exploring them with you, and thank you, and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Larson. And before we go to our panel, I'd like to recognize Chairman Schuster. Uh, before I do that, though, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Schuster and Mr. Rahal for the particular attention they are paying to aviation industry uh, issues, to the stakeholder problems, uh, to participating in what we're doing on an aviation standpoint and recognizing the critical importance from a safety standpoint and an economic standpoint. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and you're recognized. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, first, I want to uh, thank the Chairman for, uh, for those kind words, and I appreciate that he and Mr. Larson are working so hard and diligent uh, on the issues that face uh, the aviation in America, which I think are are serious and we really need to pay attention to it and as I've said in a, a number of uh, statements and speeches uh, we really need to look at how we operate whether it's in manufacturing and the pressure they're under from foreign uh, foreign competition or our airlines uh, and the competition that it's they're they're facing out there uh, to uh, the burdens we put on on both segments or, or all segments of the aviation industry uh, from the government. So again, we need to, and we've started that discussion, and I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Larson and Lobianda's participation. Uh, I too want to uh, thank the, uh, the Colgan families for, for their efforts. Uh, thanks for being here today, and we look forward to continuing to, to, to work with you. Um, in my home state of Pennsylvania, aviation plays a critical role in our economy, supporting over 300,000 jobs. Uh, with continued investment in our national aviation system, small and rural communities will be able to stay connected to our nation's larger cities and markets. Airports in my district, like Altoona Blair County Airport and uh, the neighboring district, the uh, Johnstown Airport, uh, act as economic engines in attracting and supporting businesses. The airport provides a critical, critical link 
to the rest of the country that is necessary for local businesses to thrive and reach markets that otherwise may be not possible. Uh, the Sheets Corporation, uh, for those of you that have ever traveled to Pennsylvania or outside of Washington, uh, it's a very successful convenience store operator in, the, in my district, headquartered in my district. Uh, it relies on the transportation network around the Altoona Blair County Airport to remain successful. Uh, without the vital uh, link uh, the airport provides in connecting to the rest of the country, uh, many businesses like Sheets would be forced to operate elsewhere. But in small and rural areas across the country, like the district that I represent, uh, we have seen a reduction in overall air service, uh, market consolidation, government mandates on pilot training, and other economic factors that all play a significant role in the trends that we've seen. I'm committed to finding solutions that will help retain and protect critical air services to keep small and rural airports up and running, protect jobs, and provide the critical access to those local economies. I look forward to hearing from our panel today. Thank all of our panel members for, for being here and taking the time, uh, especially the two airport directors, uh, the steps they have taken to keep their airports central uh, to the local economy. Um, you are the guys on the ground who are always looking at ways to improve the airports and generate uh, generate local business, and we appreciate that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schuster. Now we're going to turn to our panel. Uh, our witnesses today are the Honorable Susan Curlin, Assistant Secretary of Aviation and International Affairs at the Department of Transportation. Um, a frequent guest, Dr. Dillingham, we're happy you're back. Uh, Dr. Dillingham is Director of Civil Aviation Issues for the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Uh, Captain Lee Moak, also another frequent guest. Uh, Captain, thank you for being here. Uh, he is the president of the Airline Pilots Association. Uh, Mr. Byron Bedford, president and CEO of Republic Airways Holding. Mr. Dan Mann, executive director of the Cumberland or Columbia Metropolitan Airport. And Mr. Brian Springer, airport director of Bozeman Yellowstone International Airport. Uh, Secretary Curlin, you're recognized for your statement. Chairman Lobiando, Chairman Schuster, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the state of air service at small and rural communities. Like Congress, the department understands how vitally important air service links are to these communities. I will concentrate my remarks on two congressionally mandated programs that the department administers which provide communities with resources to address their air service needs. The Essential Air Service Program, EAS, and the Small Community Air Service Development Program, SCASDAP. The EAS program currently subsidizes service to 160 communities nationwide, including 43 in Alaska. The program connects rural America with the rest of our country and indeed with the entire world. The financial investment in achieving that connectivity has, in a number of cases, led communities to being able to substantially reduce or even eliminate their need for federal subsidy. For instance, between 2011 and 2013, with the right carrier, equipment, and frequency levels, Joplin, Missouri saw its annual subsidy need drop from $2.8 million to $340,000. Further, Examples of communities that have been able to eliminate federal subsidies include Rock Springs in Riverton, Wyoming, Dickinson, North Dakota, and Manhattan, Kansas. Unfortunately, the program's ability to match the right carrier, equipment, and frequency level is becoming increasingly more challenging. Several airlines that had traditionally served EAS communities have shut down or withdrawn from the program, leaving it with fewer carriers and higher costs. In addition, residents of many EAS communities are choosing to drive to cities where low fare service options are offered, thereby reducing employment levels on EAS services. Right-sizing equipment has also become much more difficult because the number of regional airlines that have the appropriately sized equipment for the program has continued to decline. For the last 20 years or more, the backbone of the EAS program has been the 19 to 34 seat aircraft. However, those aircraft are aging and being retired with no replacement aircraft of comparable size. And finally, a number of recent developments in the industry has resulted in a current shortage of pilots, which has caused a strain in carriers' abilities to serve small communities. As Congress debates reauthorization of aviation programs, 
I think there'll be an opportunity for a comprehensive discussion of these issue, issues and how best to address them. And I want to commend the subcommittee for getting an early start on that process. The department also administers SCASDAP. Small communities apply for these grants, which the department awards annually based on a comparative analysis of proposals. Over the last few fiscal years, the annual SCASDAP budget has been $10 million or less, and the department has awarded an average of about 25 grants a year. <coughs> the program has clearly experienced some notable success stories. For example, after the department awarded a grant to the Akron Canton o uh, Airport in Ohio to support new nonstop flights to LaGuardia, traffic increased by 100 percent, and this service is still in place today. Among other communities that have experienced similar success are Provo, Utah, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Some independent reviews have concluded that the program has had a limited success rate. However, it is important that the criteria for measuring a successful outcome reflect Congress's goals for the program. In a program designed to foster innovative approaches among communities that have had the most difficulty in attracting and sustaining air service on their own, there will inevitably be some grants that do not completely fulfill sponsors' objectives. The Department views SCASDAP as a laboratory for communities to explore creative ideas to develop their air service. Our transparent process in administering the program allows communities to learn what works and what does not, and to use this collective experience in their own air service development plans. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I would be happy to answer any questions that you or your colleagues may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Dr. Dillingham, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Schuster, Ranking Member Larson, members of the subcommittee. Always a pleasure, always an honor to be invited before the subcommittee. Since 2001, the nation's airline industry has experienced considerable turmoil, including two economic downturns, the events of 9-11, and rising fuel costs, as well as several airline bankruptcies and restructuring. Over the last four years, however, the airline industry has rebounded, becoming more profitable in part due to their better management of available capacity. In fact, our research shows that the number of flights since 2007 has declined for all sizes of airports, with the notable exception of EAS airports. The situation for small communities is exacerbated by a range of factors, including the, the decline of population in small communities and what we sometimes refer to as leakage of potential small airport customers to, to nearby airports with more frequent and lower priced service. Other factors on the horizon include the phasing out of the perimeter rule, the lack of qualified pilots, and FAA's recent tentative order that EAS communities must have an average of 10 employments per day to participate in the EAS program. My statement this morning focuses on three issues how the EAS and the Small Community Air Service Development Programs have affected services to small communities and suggestions to enhance the connectivity of those communities to the National Transportation Network. Regarding the EAS program, overall, the size and cost of the program has increased. Specifically, between 2002 and 2012, the number of communities participating in the program has grown from 94 to 160. The total annual subsidy for the program has increased steadily from $89.6 million in 2002 to as much as $225 million in 2012. The, the per community subsidy has also increased during that same time period, almost doubling from $1 million to just under $2 million. EAS airports as a whole have also experienced an increase in service since 2007. However, as of 2013, planes serving airports that provide EAS service were 49% full, while planes serving all airports were nearly 83% full. Regarding the small community program, overall the size and cost of the small community air service program has decreased. Between 2002 and 2013, an average of about 30 grants were awarded. The total grant amount for the program has declined steadily from 20 million in 2002 to 6 million in 2013. Multiple studies consistently suggest overall mixed results regarding the success of this program. Although the grants that could be deemed successful were in the minority, those grants did generally result in improved services in terms of adding flights, airlines, and destination, and curbing customer leakage. 
Those grants deemed not successful generally did not achieve the objectives proposed in their grant application and often did not sustain service or other benefits after the grant was completed or funding ceased. Regarding our suggestions to enhance connectivity, some small communities in danger of losing airline service or hoping to attract new service have opted to provide a range of incentives. These incentives include revenue guarantees like, that, like those mentioned by the chairman that were proposed at Atlantic City International and non-financial in-kind contributions like advertising the air service. Additionally, we have recommended that DOT consider pursuing the goal of connectivity through a multimodal approach. This approach would explore up whether services such as air taxis or ground transportation to larger airports might supplement the EAS program and better serve some communities at a lower cost. DOT has taken steps towards including multimodal possibilities in both the EAS and small community program. We are hopeful that these developments will help the Congress and DOT identify opportunities to make the EAS program more cost effective and strengthen the small community program, thus helping to ensure connectivity for small communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dillingham. Uh, Captain Moak. Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the subcommittee, I'm Captain Lee Moak, President of the Airline Pilots Association, and thank you for allowing me to be here to represent ALPA's more than 51,000 members who fly for 32 airlines in the United States and Canada. Small community air service is an important component of our nation's air transportation. While today's hearing is focused on this subject, the most serious challenge faced by this sector is one that threatens the entire U.S. airline industry, foreign airlines that are state-owned or supported, and foreign airlines that are attempting to use business models that conflict directly with U.S. government policy. The economic threat to U.S. airlines is very real. If the United States fails to take action to counter it, U.S. airlines will struggle to compete internationally, and for that reason, I thank you, Chairman Lobiondo and Representative Larson, for your vigilant oversight of our Open Skies agreements. I may be biased, but I believe U.S. airlines and their workers are the best in the world. We just need, ha need to have sound government policies that give them a fair opportunity to compete. I also thank both of you for your understanding of the threat posed by the Norwegian Air International's flag of convenience business model. You represent regions with once vibrant shipping industries and know the threat that these schemes pose to U.S. industry and jobs. We urge this committee to stay engaged. Likewise, we respect that this committee understands that many state-owned and state-sponsored airlines are competing with different rules, whether it's no corporate taxes or favorable regulatory policies. The U.S. government must level the playing field for U.S. airlines. Now, I recognize that I was invited here primarily to talk about an alleged pilot shortage, so I want to be clear right now, there is no <laughs> current shortage of qualified pilots in this country. There is, however, a shortage of pay and benefits for qualified pilots. The average beginning pay at a regional airline is about $24,000. From ALPA's award-winning involvement on aviation university campuses, we know that many new pilots will spend $200,000 or more on their education and flight training. Unfortunately, some new pilots are turning to other careers because they cannot earn a living wage at a regional airline. The lack of a career path for new pilots is also a major concern, and some airlines, one in particular, JetBlue, are working to establish clear career progression to attract new graduates. In addition, thousands of experienced U.S. airline pilots fly for foreign airlines because of the pay and benefits they offer when compared with U.S. airlines. Now, I know these pilots, if given the ability, would choose to live and work in the United States where, if they were offered competitive pay and working conditions. ALPA strongly supports the Essential Air Service Program. However, a number of ESA, ESA airlines have been vocal about an alleged pilot shortage. And last year, some of these carriers took tens of millions of federal EAS dollars while paying their first officers near 
poverty level wages. More troubling, certain U.S. airlines are attempting to use this contrived pilot shortage as an excuse to roll back the safety gains realized with the new pilot fatigue rule and first officer qualification requirements that were legislated by this subcommittee. These new safety requirements were developed with input from industry, labor, and government. That's where we do our best work when working together. The Regional Airline Association was co-chair of the First Officer Qualification Aviation Rulemaking Committee, and the airlines have had years to prepare for their implementation. While no shortage exists now, avoiding one in the future depends on whether U.S. airlines offer pilots competitive wages and benefits and a solid co career, a market-based solution. So achieve this, Congress should examine with DOT the government's relationship with regional airlines that accept millions of dollars under EAS program while offering wages and benefits at levels so low they cannot fill their pilot seats. And the U.S. government must ensure our industry does business on a level playing field that allows U.S. airlines to compete and prevail internationally by, among other actions, eliminating regulatory bureaucracy and reducing airline taxes. In conclusion, stronger U.S. airlines mean better profits, more flights to small communities, and improve wages and benefits to attract and retain qualified airline pilots. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Moak. Mr. Bedford, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman Lobiondo, uh, Chairman Schuster, who's no longer with us, but Ranking Member Larson and the members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify this morning. My name is Brian Bedford. I am here representing Republic Airways. Republic Airways is a large regional airline operating in the United States. We employ uh, over 6,300 people, uh, many of them in your districts. We have over 600 employees in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, aside from being a large regional airline, Republic is also a very old regional airline. We operated our first flight in August of 1974 from Jamestown, New York to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Republic Airways is proud of its safety tradition. In our 40 years of business, we have maintained an unblemished passenger safety record, uh, and it's our intention to continue that tradition. When I joined the company in 1999, our company operated a fleet of 28 turboprop aircraft. We had fewer than 600 employees. Today, we operate over 1,300 flights a day all across the country. Last year alone, we safely flew over 21 and a half million passengers to their destinations. During my tenure through the uh, past 15 years, we've faced extraordinary challenges in our industry. Obviously, the challenge of 9-11 was significant for us. The challenge of SARS, Asian currency crisis, escalating fuel prices, every one of our major airline partners going through restructuring, some twice, some not surviving. Uh, it has been an extraordinary time in our industry. Uh, and yet, the most, I, I think the most uh, urgent crisis we face in my over 25 years of the industry is the issue of a pilot shortage. And while I appreciate the opportunity to speak today to the panel or to the members of the subcommittee on EAS, I, I think that's a secondary issue to actually making sure we have competent, qualified pilots able to fly the mission. Uh, so with that, rather than use my time to uh, uh, restate the testimony that I provide in a written format, uh, what I would like to talk about is uh, some of the comments we've already heard from the panel today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we've all referenced a pilot shortage uh, report from the GAO. Um, uh, there, to be factually correct, the GAO referenced the fact that there is a mixed indication of whether a shortage exists or not. But I think the, the uh, analysis itself falls flat on, on one important point, and that's the data of looking at pilot wages cited the uh, study period from 2000 to 2012 where pilot wages were decreasing, and in a, a constrained labor environment, we'd expect rising wages. What the report fails to discuss is the context of the decreasing wages, which is 9-11, the rampant restructuring of the airline industry. If the study period had been from 2008 to 2012, we would have seen a significant increase in wages and benefits, mainly due to the constructive engagement of Captain Milk uh, and his, his uh, leadership at ALPA. And while I, I'm not you know, personally uh, friends with Captain Moak, I certainly respect his leadership and his engagement, especially uh, for people that I do know and respect at uh, Delta Airlines who have been you know, very, very 
complimentary of Captain Oak's leadership there during Delta's dark years. And I welcome Captain Oak's leadership and that of ALPA as we talk about a very important issue. Uh, I also don't disagree with uh, Captain Moog's market-based solutions approach. Uh, first officer pay does need to increase, and I can't spend my limited time discussing the, the challenges with that, but I do hope the members of the subcommittee will ask me follow-up questions on compensation. Um, finally, let me give you some Republic Airline experience. Last year, we intended to hire 500 new crew members. We found over 2,400 qualified applicants based on the current statute. We were only able to find 450 pilots that met our hiring standards, 450 out of 2,400, quote, qualified applicants. Rather than hiring 50 uh, pilots that didn't meet our standards, we decided to take the unprecedented step of parking aircraft, grounding 27 of our small regional jets and leading to the disconnection of service to num numerous small towns and, and even medium-sized communities in our country. You know, Republic Airways is not going to sacrifice its standards and its safety culture to hire marginal pilots. There are, however, plenty of qualified applicants that do not meet the current legislative requirements. So what do I think we need to do? First, we need the committee to urge the FAA to use the full flexibility provided under the statute. What do I mean by that? Well, the ARC, which Captain Moak referenced, which the RAA did participate on, did make recommendations. They simply weren't accepted uh, by FAA. We need the ARC committee re uh, recommendations to be uh, the, the accepted standard for hiring new pilots in our profession. Secondarily, the FAA took a very rigid view, a very narrow view of the word academic in terms of providing experiential training credit. Uh, and uh, sitting here today, I believe we have fewer than 25 uh, uh, universities have been accepted under the FAA's criteria for academic training. We need that expanded to be inclusive of all structured academy type training. And then finally, we do urge the committee to consider the viability of the profession in terms of assistance in, in uh, uh, vocational training for new, the next generation of pilots entering the workforce. This is a serious issue. I do I uh, sincerely appreciate the opportunity to participate in the panel today so that we can have a serious debate about it. But at the end of the day, if we work constructively together, I am confident we can find a solution that will allow us not only to maintain the safest aviation system in the, in the world uh, and also provide a significant service to small and medium-sized communities. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Bedford. Uh, Mr. Mann, you are recognized for your statement. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate in the hearing today. It's an honor for me to be here. <clears throat> my name is Dan Mann. I'm the executive director of Columbia Metropolitan Airport, and this is my third airport where I've been the director. Each airport and community had the same concerns and goals. They all wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, they all wanted better service to improve economic development efforts. The message is the same, better fares, more direct flights, and reliable service. To meet those goals, what I've found to be consistent and effective is to first get the airport financial house in order and second, make sure the community has realistic expectations. Only after you have a solid airport business plan and community support can you be effective offering creative incentives to airlines for improved service. In Columbia, the challenges were especially great. Compared to 20 similar sized airports, our costs were over $12 per passenger, our debt was excessive, excessive, and we had the highest number of employees of the 20 benchmarked airports. That, in addition to the challenge of being one and a half hour drive from Charlotte, the sixth largest airport in the country. We had to do some significant changes to our business plan. We had to do community outreach to, to have any hope at all of uh, keeping the air service we had and, uh, and growing. After a significant reorganization, we reduced debt by $20 million. We reduced staff from 120 to 65, and we were able to get our costs to below $9 per passenger. Fortunately for Columbia, we had a good economy, a growing population, and after our financial uh, position improved, we were able to make a business case to Delta Airlines uh, for more capacity and uh, competitive airfares. After six years of declining employments in Columbia, we saw growth in 2012 and 2013. And pending uh, uh, good weather, uh, we think 2014 is also going to be a good year for us. While incentives were not required in Columbia, I've used a SCSI grant on two occasions at two other airports. Again, only after we had our airport finances in place and community support 
were we able to uh, have a good plan for the community outreach grant. Uh, in uh, Casper, Wyoming, we actually bought an aircraft. It was kind of a crazy scheme, but we bought an aircraft. Uh, we had an airline that was willing to lease it beforehand. We applied for the grant and was awarded that. We bought the airplane, leased it to the airline, and generated enough passengers to uh, have follow-on service with Northwest Airlines to Minneapolis-St. Paul. That service stayed in place uh, for several years and up until the merger with Delta Airlines. The good news about that is it was an asset that we, we were able to sell at a later date, and we reimbursed uh, the SCSI grant nearly the entire amount of the grant monies. At each airport, the air service challenges were great, and I believe the solutions must come from airports on a local level, and the best assistance we can get from the regu regulatory bodies is granting more flexibility and control with airport-generated revenue. I think airports that have a good, solid financial plan, local support, um, can come up with their own solutions, and that's probably the best alternative. The best chance of success, um, even with a sound business plan and community support, not all communities will be able to sustain commercial service. Um, that's just the fact of, of the business we're in today. But the best chance we have is engaging the community, local control of airport revenue, and having, um, having the folks in the free market enterprise um, support us. Thank you for the time and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mann. Mr. Springer. Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate on this hearing on air service uh, and to uh, small and rural communities. My name is Brian Springer. I am the airport director at Bozeman Yellowstone International Airport, a small hub airport located in southwest Montana. First of all, I want to thank the members of this subcommittee for your continued commitment to our, aviation's, uh, our aviation transportation system. Aviation provides remote states such as Montana access to the world, and a strong aviation system is imperative for our continued growth. Mr. Chairman, our airport has been fortunate to see a strong, consistent pattern of growth over the past 40 years. Even through the challenging last 15 years, we have seen growth rates averaging 5% per year. In 1999, our airport handled 436,000 passengers, and this year we expect to handle nearly 1 million. Certainly, we have the advantage of the real estate adage, location, location, location. That being said, we have a philosophy at our airport that focuses everything we do on making our airport attractive and competitive. Simply put, we believe the airlines are the golden goose for smaller airports, so don't kill it. The airport industry has become quite competitive. We are competing for the same seats because the airplane servicing the Bozeman market could just as easily be servicing the Atlanta market. And we are now seeing a rationalization of airports, and the reality is not all airports will be able to retain or maintain the same level of service they now have. Consequently, we operate our airport more like a business than a government agency, and we think of our airlines more like anchor tenants in a mall we have to be competitive. We strive to have one of the lowest costs per employment for our airline partners. We provide ease of entry and exit to our, to our market and favorable gate access for all airline models. We have strong partnerships with our community. We also believe airports and communities must have skin in the game to succeed in air service development. And finally, we have invested nearly $5 million in services normally provided by the federal government, such as air traffic control, because federal agencies are slow to adapt to the changes in air service dynamics. Airlines can move assets quickly, and it is not uncommon for smaller airports to see drastic changes in air service. But we need level playing fields so that comparable airports have comparable federal services. We need our federal agencies to be able to adapt quickly and have mechanisms in place to provide services commensurate with the activity level of an airport on a fair and equitable basis. We also need policies that support and encourage airports in developing non-aeronautical revenue so that airports can minimize reliance on, revenue, reliance on revenue from the airlines. Mr. Chairman, the Bozeman Airport has benefited from the federal contract tower program and the small community air service development grants because of significant airport and local community investments. We have not shied away from doing our part to make those programs and others succeed at our airport and believe that airports and communities must have a vested interest for success. We encourage Congress to continue to modestly invest in programs that help small airports and communities attract and invest in viable commercial air service 
as well as operate safely. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you again for inviting me to participate in this hearing on air service at small and rural communities. I would be pleased to respond to any questions or comments you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Springer. I'm, I'm curious about one thing in your statement. You, you say your airport spent $5 million to supplement air traffic control. Did I hear that right? That is true. How, how did that work? Well, it's a combination of things. We spent a million and a half dollars to build our first air traffic control tower about 15 years ago. We spent another million and a half dollars to put in a, a radar in our uh, valley. Uh, we spent another $500,000 to put a radar display inside the tower. Uh, we also spent uh, uh, about uh, almost a hundred or almost a million dollars in uh, augmenting our air traffic control by adding an hour at the beginning of the day and an hour at the end of the day just to have coverage when our airlines were operating in and out of the airport because the uh, the airport was uh, the contract tower program would not provide that within their own funding. So you had to do all this through the FAA, obviously. Correct. So you you all had an idea that would uh, enhance your ability with safety and to run the airport, and then you proposed that idea to the FAA. They signed off on it, and you spent your money. We spent our money at uh, some of those projects. Took a decade to achieve. Okay. Um, for, for Mr. Mann and Mr. Springer, I'm, I'm curious about your cost per emplanement. Uh, you talked about that a little bit. Uh, how, how are you keeping it down, or how does this impact your, your business decisions? Talk to me a little bit about that number. Our costs in Columbia were, in 2010 when I arrived there, were well over $12, I, um, and we have been having declining service. I, I met with all the airlines, and uh, every one of them said, Dan, you're just not competitive, and uh, it's a mobile asset. We're going to move it. We had to get our costs under $10. That was, that was the airline's uh, goal for us. And, uh, again, we had to do that by paying down debt and, and eliminating employees. We had 120 employees. It was the most of any of the benchmarked airports, and we had to completely re reorganize. So we got down to 65, saved about uh, $2 million a year. The debt reduction saved about $3 million a year, and we were able to get it to $9. We're, we're doing that just by running it like a business. I mean, it really comes down to are we going to be effective at $12, and the answer was no, and so we had to get the cost down. And, again, we, we focused on customer service and safety, and everything else uh, was, was a luxury item. And so once we got those costs down, we went primarily to Delta Airlines, and, uh, and they responded with more capacity. And it's, it, it, was, it was really just if we wanted to be competitive, we had to, we had to take control of our own business model. I would echo what uh, Mr. Mann has said. Our cost is actually exceedingly low. Our cost per employment is uh, right now in the coming year about $2.74 per passenger. $2.74? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, we we focus. Uh, go ahead. No. Um, okay. Uh, it's a great number. Uh, we focus on, on two things. Obviously, the first thing is expenses. Like uh, Mr. Mann said, uh, you know, we, we try to maintain our expenses as low as we possibly can, yet providing a, a world class airport. Uh, but we also look at the revenue side, where we in, in basically work on uh, generating revenue from all of the non-aeronautical portions of our airport, the uh, rental cars, the parking lot, uh, the concessions inside the terminal, land, land rent. Uh, anything that we can do to generate revenue elsewhere helps us lessen the burden on, on our airline partners. Mr. Bedford, how does Republic uh, interact with the airports on this number, the employment number? Well, it depends, sir. Um, when we are offering services uh, essentially on a pro-rate basis, then yes, we are directly involved with meeting with the airport officials and trying to come up with a win-win a construct for new service. Uh, as, uh, as Assistant Secretary Curlin said, uh, we, we were actually one of the services that opened uh, from Provo, Utah to Denver uh, using jet aircraft. And that was a collaborative effort to actually build the airport and then work with this, the SCAD grant and establish service, which actually was successful until our business model changed. Um, when we're operating with our major airline partners, brands, Delta, United, U.S. Airways, American, they are actually the primary interface with the airport community. They're deciding uh, where the aircraft will operate, when they will fly. They're setting the prices and, and managing that relationship with the, uh, the ground personnel. 
Uh, Dr. Dillingham, in your statement, you indicated that there are many factors that contribute to the uh, decrease in demand for air service for small and rural communities. Uh, what would you say are the most important among those factors, and why do you think they are the most important? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the two most important factors would be, first of all, population decline. We've seen a significant uh, decline in population in rural and small communities over the last 10 to 15 years. So that affects demand. And the other, the other factor, I think, is something that was mentioned by uh, several people on the panel. That's leakage. When you, when you are able to or you choose to drive to a uh, larger airport with more service and sometimes um, cheaper prices for the Southwest or JetBlue, you take that option. So those are the, those are the two factors that I think uh, contribute to that lessening of demand, which in turn um, the airlines, you know, with their adjustment of capacity, will, will lessen their service to those small communities. Captain Moak, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. Everybody's kind of talking around the issue that's driving a lot of this, and that's the economics of the industry. Could you pull your mic a little closer? Oh, absolutely. The economics of the industry are what's driving a lot of this. If you just go back to uh, 2009 to the current uh, to 2014, oil has doubled. It has to be spread over a number of seats. We've had a couple of inappropriate uh, taxes and regulations that have come into place. Uh, one would be the $100 TSA fee that goes to debt reduction, for example. Uh, tickets are market-based. This has driven ticket prices up, and it has a, an effect at small communities that's starting the regionalization of the airline industry where people are having to make a decision if they're going to drive or not to an airport like the doctor has uh, pointed out. You can't emphasize enough how the economics are playing into what's going on here in the changing business model. That's, that's what's driving it. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bedford, could you elaborate a little bit on your recommendation or comment about a recommendation that Congress should direct the F FAA to um, use its authority to be more flexible on the uh, pilot safety training rules? Yes, sir. Um, when the uh, statute was first uh, enacted, uh, it required an uh, aviation rulemaking committee to work with FAA and all the various stakeholders, uh, including the Regional Airline Association and uh, ALPA, among others. In that process, uh, the ARC came up with a series of recommendations for the implementation of the statute. Uh, they were not implemented according to the ARC recommendation. And instead, what we have is the, the current implementation of the statute, which does provide limited relief for uh, academic training credit, uh, but not enough relief. Uh, and so essentially what we're now asking the next generation of pilots to do is to graduate with, you know, high levels of uh, proficiency and skill-based training, and then we're asking them to now spend the next 12 to 18 months essentially flying circles in the sky in single-engine uh, piston aircraft in fair weather conditions, which frankly does nothing to improve the overall safety proficiency of the pilot. In fact, you know, our experience is it leads to creation of bad habits, which, frankly, we have a hard time training out of uh, potential airmen, which is why I think we're seeing such a high rejection rate of, quote, qualified candidates that do not meet our standards. All right. Thanks. Uh, Captain Monk, would you care to respond to that? So what I think uh, we should focus on in, uh, on this issue in particular is the good work of the subcommittee of DOT and of the FAA by setting up that process, and then out of that process, we were actually able to come up with a restricted ATP, uh, answering uh, the community by being uh, smart and engaged. The restricted ATP, you uh, come out of the military with that training, you get that at 750 hours. Uh, depending on the university program that you are uh, have completed, you can get one at 1,000, and then there's one uh, perhaps out of Emory Riddle, 1,000, and then a different one at 1,250, uh, ultimately with 1,500. So I, I believe that we uh, address those uh, then, 
okay? And it was a smart way to address it. But I, I do want to kind of focus back on your question uh, quickly here. You know, we're some carriers perhaps are having trouble uh, recruiting uh, some FOs, and I have tried to point that this is a market-based problem based on the pay that we're paying them. And if this was a conversation that we were having about hospitals and hospitals having trouble getting doctors, we wouldn't be focused on the certification or the education reducing that so that we could get doctors in to fulfill seats. We wouldn't be doing that. So what, we're do what we need to be doing here today is focused on the economics that are driving the problem. And like Mr. Bedford said, the major airlines, the brands, are not in the room today. And they are the ones that are making decisions what small communities you fly to, what uh, frequency at hub airports. They're making those decisions, and they are the ones that are pulling service down based on the economics of the routes. The economics are driving it. Uh, Dr. Dillingham, uh, in your report, um, you reported that da data indicate that a large pool of qualified pilots does exist relative to projected demand, but whether such pilots are willing or available to work at wages being offered is unknown. Uh, does an adequate pool of qualified pilots exist yes. to meet projected demand by the airlines? Can you answer that in a yes or no? Is that possible? All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Know, I asked the yes. question. You answer the way you want it. Okay. So the short answer is yes. Uh, but I want to go back to something that's been said on the panel uh, by Mr. Bedford and others to sort of clarify what the GAO report actually reported. Sure. Um, we, we, it was one of those reports, uh, Mr. Larson, where we found that everybody found something in it that they liked and they used it uh, to their best interest. We, in fact, said by the numbers, the BLS numbers, labor statistic numbers that we used, that two out of three indicators indicated that there was not a pilot shortage. Secondly, we also, we also said that, uh, that the regional airlines were indeed indicating that they were having a difficult time finding qualified uh, first officers. We also said in that report that the major carriers said they were not having a difficult time finding uh, qualified pilots. And, and directly to your question, what we also said in the report is that there's a projected need of about 10,000 pilots over the next few years, and we've, we found information that indicated that there were some 70,000 qualified pilots, qualified meaning that they had the ATP, they had the first class medical and they, they were working in maybe or working in various other occupations, some non-airline, some airline, some in foreign countries. So, you know, the, the direct answer is, you know, those pilots are out there. Why they are, why the regionals are having a difficult time is something that the regionals can speak to better than I. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that's fine for now. I may have a second round. A lot of members here, so I'll uh, yield back. Okay, we're now going to turn to Mr. Hanna. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Bedford, uh, Mr. Moak, um, it's fascinating to me that <clears throat> we're, we're talking about something that's kind of, we're both talking about market-based solutions, right, and yet we have a pilot who clearly $24,000 a year is underpaid. And yet, you had 2,500 applications. You're able to find 470 something that fits your requirements. So that's almost contradictory in its nature. That that we have somebody who both people believe in the market. Your pilots are underpaid. You can't find enough pilots. I feel like I'm missing something in this conversation here. We're talking about training people to be prepared. We have requirements to train them, but they don't meet what you want. Um, uh, I, I guess I'd love to hear the two of you to talk about that together because it sounds like you're really arguing from the same position but and for the same people. Um, so, um, Mr. Bedford, why am I getting a headache over this? <laughs> well, trust me, Congressman, I share your headache. Um, I, I think the, you know, we, we're splitting hairs on 
what is, what, what's the definition of qualified? There's a statutory definition that has now been codified in the form of the FAA's uh, rulemaking process, which Mr. Moak speak to, that discusses uh, qualified as being someone with 1,500 hours in an ATP. I can assure you that having 1,500 hours in an ATP does not make you qualified to fly as a commercial airline pilot. So yes, there may be 70,000 registered ATP holders. I don't know how old they are. I'm probably in that database somewhere. I'm not qualified to fly anymore, okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have a shortage of qualified pilots. You know, Mr. Or, I'm sorry, Captain Milk. I don't mean to disrespect no, no you. <laughs> you know, Captain Milk talked about uh, you know equating this to uh, a hospital training. Well, you know we don't take uh, you know people who are emer newly emerged from medical school and then send them off to be you know library technicians or something. You know, letting their skills atrophy. And what we find is uh, young men and women coming out of uh, qualified training programs, when we hire them, as long as they don't have bad habits, we invest another $30,000 in training them to our requirements. Um, as far as entry-level pay and market-based solutions, I absolutely agree with Captain Moke on this. FO wages are too low. But there must be something attractive about being a pilot, Mr. Moke. If uh, I'm a pilot, I'm, a, I'm the most dangerous one in the sky. I'm a private pilot. The, uh, but when, when people will actually take $24,000 a year, there must be some expectation that they'll do better later because that's, that, that's starvation wages. So um, part of that must be the market that they're anticipating or the shortage that must uh, exist, although you would suggest that one would suggest that with that kind of pay, people willing to do it, um, supply and demand, um, which might suggest a whole number of things, but go ahead. So, uh, Congressman Hanna, first, uh, being a seaplane pilot uh, certificated like yourself, you're probably one of the safest pilots because I see you sitting here today, and I know how <laughs> difficult that flying is uh, to be able to reuse the airplane. So far, so good, you know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but, look, uh, the, the issue here is the, 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 the market has changed. There was a glut during um, what was considered the uh, deregulation uh, bankruptcy period, when this Congress deregulated the airline industry, it did it for scheduled service uh, product. It didn't deregulate with the idea that we would compete on safety, security, or labor. That, that wasn't the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it had the vision and the foresight to uh, protect small communities with e EAS programs and others. Uh, great. So now, many years later, we're at this point, and at this particular point, the market rates for entry-level FOs uh, who are going to college, who are getting their certificates, are much higher than the union contracts. People are competing for our best and our brightest coming out of college. Mm -hmm. They're competing for it. They're going overseas. Some are going directly to mainline. So what we have going on here is the right regulations, the right oversight, the right certification uh, that this group, uh, again, had the vision to put in place with FAR 117 that now guaranteed that, that a pilot would not be fatigued during his rotation, that he would, imagine this, he would get eight hours behind the door at a hotel so he could be rested. Those things are all good, they're positive. But what's going on is merely a economics and market problem for some carriers. The solution is to compete and pay more. That's the solution. Mm -hmm. and that's what we need to focus on. If I, if I may just add a, a, a quick commentary. Um, first of all, there are, the, flying is one of the, the, the best jobs in the world. You've been up there, I've been up there. Until you do it, I mean, it's hard to really put into terms the, just the, the beauty and the you know, the fulfillment that you get. And it's a serious business, though, and it doesn't work for everybody. So you can go out and you can get time and you can get ratings. That doesn't, again, qualify you as a pilot. What's unfortunate, I think, is a, a regulation that limits the ability of truly qualified pilots to actually practice their craft and forces them into a time-consuming, laborious, unproductive, unstructured, and unhelpful and financially draining process of accumulating time simply to check a box. 
Hmm. Either our training programs are safe and proficient, or they're not, and the FAA should decertify any airline that cannot operate to a single level of sta safety equivalent to any major international carrier. That ought to be the focus. Either pilots are proficient and safe, or they have no business being in a cockpit. And I would challenge the, the fact that the arbitrary nature of how the ultimate regulation was imposed was codified is not fulfilling the desires of the families of Colgan Flight 3407. It's not building safety into the cockpit. In fact, I fear it's pushing us in the other direction where we may have less qualified guys, although qualified per statute, potentially coming into these cockpits. And I think we do that at great risk. Now, as far as the economics are concerned, Republic is a highly unionized company. Over 75% of our employees participate in labor unions predominantly the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Our flight attendants, our pilots, our dispatchers all participate in labor organizations. We respect the process. But on numerous occasions over the past three years, without any uh, hooks into Section 6 bargaining, we have attempted to dramatically increase first officer pay, which, by the way, in the first year of employment at Republic, first officer's compensation is in excess of $30,000. On top of additional $6,000 in health care and 401k contributions that come to the pilot, on top of the $30,000 of investment we make in training them to our specifications. So there's an extraordinary amount of investment, and that is career investment that they will carry with them throughout the entirety of their career. Why do people work for $30,000 a year? The goal is to get to mainline carriers where they're going to enjoy $150,000 to $250,000 of compensation. Uh, should we regulate, should we tell Apple computer, should we tell Apple that you can only hire employees that have 10 years of experience? Mr. Bedford, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. We're, we're, <laughs> we're trying to be flexible here. Thank uh, you. But we're trying to be respectful of the other members' time as well. Um, and if we need to, we'll come back in round two if you want to continue. Mr. Nolan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel for their candor and their testimony here. It's been uh, very, very interesting and enlightening. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, first I, I would like to ask unanimous consent that a statement by uh, uh, Bob Anderson, the mayor of International Falls, Minnesota, the coldest spot in the nation, be uh, uh, included in the record? Without objection, so ordered. And then secondly, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that a statement by our former chairman and our colleague Jim Oberstar also be inserted into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll yield the rest of my time, and if my questions don't get answered, I'll, I'll pursue them at the end of the hearing. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Nolan, we thank you. Mr. Daines, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have some questions for Mr. Springer. And, uh, uh, Mr. Springer, thank you for coming to Washington to testify. Uh, you truly have set a great example as uh, leading a successful airport management model. Uh, I thought the, the metrics you shared were very impressive, and I guess I'm a little bit biased given uh, that's my home airport, Bozeman, Montana. Uh, my mom and dad moved to Bozeman in 1964. I went to kindergarten through college there, and I've really watched the transformation of what's happened there at that airport. And I also want to compliment you on, on the tremendous service provided to our community and the economic driver. As, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we were able to build a company there in Bozeman that virtually started from nothing to 1,100 employees with 17 offices around the world, a product with 33 languages. Uh, I managed Asia Pacific with offices in Tokyo and Sydney, headquartered and living in Bozeman, Montana, because I had an airport I could get in and out of every week. That business capitalized at $1.8 billion, so we built a large business. Had it not been for Montana State University there supplying uh, graduates as well as University Cross Montana and a great airport, we could not have done it. It's as simple as that, so thank you. Thank you. I was, uh, I was struck by the metric you shared on the, the cost per employment, um, that CPE number of uh, sub three bucks. And when I looked at the, in your testimony, the average profit Per passenger, the airlines is about $4.13, as I saw from the 2013 numbers. Obviously, that's a pretty, the 413 is a pretty small number, and keeping your numbers at sub $3 on the CPE, very, very impressive. Uh, how did you do that, and what recommendation would you give to other small airports? And by the way, for those who have not been to the Bozeman Airport, when you see these, these low cost numbers, 
I can tell you the Bozeman Airport is one of the nicest airports in the world, and I have been to most of them. It's an amazing airport in terms of the quality of service, the ambiance, uh, and that's why a lot of folks like to come in and out of there. But explain to us how you achieve these, these uh, incredibly efficient numbers. Well, one of the, uh, the first parts on the, on the cost side is uh, maintaining our, our personnel costs. Personnel costs are one of the biggest costs that we have at the airport, and our, our full-time equivalent employees is uh, about 31. Uh, I think sometimes one of the benefits uh, of being a growing airport is that we started small and we've tried to remain small, uh, especially on the staff side. So uh, being able to maintain those costs has been a, an important part. Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, as equally important as generating the revenue from other sources and relying on that revenue and not just increasing your cost because you can also increase the cost of the airlines. That's a, that's a conundrum that uh, I think many airports get into, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't do that. We very much focus on, on continually lowering, lowering our airline cost per employment, uh, quite honestly, because we are competing against every other airport in the country for seats. And the only, one of the only things that we can do to compete is to have our costs low. Yeah, and, and you think of, I guess, Bozeman is a smaller airport, but you're, you're the busiest now in Montana, and congratulations on it. looks like you're going to hit a million passengers uh, in 2014. You know, impressive growth. Thank you. And a lot of those passengers come in July and August, I know, when there's a certain thing called a trout that seems to be running around the streams <laughs> of Montana. To say I was fly fishing in Montana before Brad Pitt ruined it for the rest of us, I said. But... Um, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, in your testimony, you discussed the role the contract tower plays uh, at the Bozeman Airport. Could you elaborate further on this point? Well, we are a contract tower program airport, and it's worked extremely well for us from the standpoint it got us a tower when we would not have been able to justify a tower 15 years ago. Uh, the challenge now is, is that we've grown to, a, to become a small hub airport and the contract tower program is really designed for the smaller airports around the country. And there's really no mechanism for you know, the FAA to uh, really uh, allow airports to grow into either a federal tower or grow from a federal or shrink from a federal tower to a contract tower. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, for us, there are airports of comparable size that have uh, substantially more uh, services uh, than what we do. And we have a staffing level of only five controllers and one, one manager to, to really accommodate 18 hours a day. It creates challenges uh, when we have uh, periods of time during the day where we may have 80 landings or takeoffs in an hour. Uh, Mr. Pranger, I'm, I'm on my time. Let me ask you, if you were to give us one recommendation, one or two for the FAA and for this committee that would help make your life easier trying to do here of running one of the most efficient airports in America in terms of CP, what would that be? have services commensurate with the size of the airport so that as you grow you get more services as you shrink you you accordingly have services that are uh, appropriate for your size okay thank you I'm out of time mr chairman thank you okay thank you mr danes now we'll go to uh mr bouchon thank you mr chairman i'll use a few health care analogies i was a a heart surgeon before I came to Congress, and I think I'm very interested in the pilot pay issue because I had a young man from my district that came in who was a pilot for a regional airline, and we discussed this issue. And, you know, I, I do kind of see it in the context of medical training also. I mean, you know, you don't come right out of medical school and do open heart surgery. You don't probably come right out of college and immediately, you know, immediately fly a 747, you know, across an ocean. Um, and, and so, I do agree with a free market approach uh, to that, and it, it, it appears to me as long as young people are willing to take a job for twenty whatever twenty four thousand dollars a year, and as long as that supply ha that supply demand balance is there, people will continue to, you know, the pay will be will be an issue. Um, but it's like residency training programs. You know, when you get out of medical school, your pay is not consistent with a practicing physician, and I do see it as a uh, you know, a stepping stone to advance to a higher level. I mean, uh, uh, and in that, the other issue is, is the, I'm, I was really curious about what the difference between the captain and, and Mr. Bedford said about training and talking to Mr. Hanna about this issue. You know, in, in medicine, if, 
you, if you do multiple, multiple hernia surgeries, it doesn't qualify you eventually to be a heart surgeon. You actually have to do things that, you know, that you have to advance and do more advanced training to get you there. And it, 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 that seems like an, a similar analogy. That's why I'm wondering, uh, Captain, um, why, is the, why is there a little disagreement, you know, under the kind of an undercurrent of disagreement about the, the training qualifications between uh, uh, Mr. Bed Mr. Bedford, maybe the airlines, and what the pilots see? Just uh, real quick, I, I have two slides I'd like to show that answers this, if I could bring them up if they're available. Um, and one of them is actually a compliment to Mr. Bedford's uh, company. Uh, and if we could pull them out quickly, I think it would help uh, illustrate it. Uh, the, first one, uh, the first one is just to show you the economic part really quick. And this gives you an idea, if you could hold up the fuel one, this gives you an idea of what's happened over the last few years in a barrel of fuel. It completely, it's gone up so much that it covers the entire cost of a pilot. Now, uh, companies can't control this variable, okay? They can't control pilot costs. Economics are the biggest problem for small communities. The second slide, the second one, is simply uh, a proactive action by uh, Republic Airways. And this is an ATP ad where uh, for approximately $70,000 after you've gotten some certificates, Republic will give you an interview. They actually show up and they do the right thing. They're out there recruiting pilots and trying to get their qualifications in this program. That type of proactive action is we need, we need more of that. So I think the difference we, uh, I'll speak for me, <laughs> a difference that we're seeing here is I believe we're kind of beating around that this is an economic issue, that the market has changed, that if we don't adapt, uh, we're going to fail, and we've got to focus on the primary driver. Now, uh, near term, some properties may be having this problem, but I can't force pilots to work for reduced wages, nor would anybody want that. And back to your original question on heart surgeons, uh, we have people in the room today and people that I believe when a customer buys a ticket, when they buy a ticket, they expect the same quality operation from start to finish. Uh, and if you're getting your heart or brain, and I guess in my case, brain surgery done, you want to make sure that you have uh, the person that's yeah. been... Uh, let, me, let me just say, I, I, I'm in full agreement that pilots are, uh, uh, these pilots are underpaid because the, they have the trust of the, of the flying public and uh, this, you know, and when you do step on an airplane, you don't really think that one pilot is going to not be quite as good as another pilot. I mean, it doesn't. For every level of flight, the pilot has to be really good because people's lives are on the line. You know, if you if you mess up. But I'm also not one that believes that we can fix prices for whatever employment there is. You know, you can't. You can't. So that it it has to be some sort of a. Uh, to get their pilot pay, it has to be some sort of supply and demand issue to get the pilot pay up, and that may mean if there is a, you know, if there is a developing shortage of pilots, and I think there probably is because there's health care providers are in short, shorter supply too, that eventually those wages will have to go up because of sheer competitive forces, and I think uh, it's, a com it's a very difficult situation. All of us also maybe some of the school teachers that are teaching our kids, we feel, I feel, are underpaid for what they do, but that's just the market. So what do, what do we do about it? Mr. Bedford, you have any comments? Uh, yeah, yes, Congressman, I do. Uh, uh, part of the challenge we have, and I'd, I'd appreciate Captain Moak's feedback on this, uh, is you know, we're in an organized labor situation. On multiple occasions, we've actually tried to increase first officer pay by over 25 percent, and it's been uh, essentially our union won't allow us to do it. And it's hard to square the circle when your union says our employees, you know, need more money, and yet they won't let us pay them more money. So I'd very much be interested in Captain Moak's, you know, just expertise as to why, uh, you know, labor unions actually reject pay increases okay. when they Thank you. My, my time's expired, so I think we can finish this uh, later on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Graves, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for uh, Mr. Bedford. The uh, pilot shortage has been something I've been looking at for a long time and qualifications, and I'd like for you to expand a little bit, too, on 
you know, Mr. Dillingham talks about uh, the number of pilots that are out there, and, and uh, I'm a recent ATP. And I've got 3,500 hours, um, so I fall into that category. Are you available? I'm not qualified to, uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. And you just held up that, reminded me that uh, uh, slide that was held up, you know, advertises for the ATP school. Nothing against the ATP school, but you can go on a one-day course, pay your $295, um, pass your ATP test uh, the next morning for Part 121, and uh, you know, and we've got guys out there that are uh, uh, that are uh, uh, you know young, just building time. That's all they're doing, building time to 15 hour, 1,500 hours um, to take that you know one day ATP course, and then hopefully jump in uh, uh, the right seat. But you and I both know that they're not uh, qualified, and I'd like you to expand on that a little bit because I know pilots out there. In fact, we got combat pilots that are 22 years old going into combat at 300 hours. And it's about the decision-making qualities that they have. It's all about the decision-making uh, mentality that they have. Um, you know, I know pilots that are not ATPs. They're commercial. They're crop dusters. Um, they're high-time pilots. And I would much rather step into an airplane with them than I would. There's guys out there that have 20,000 hours that I wouldn't fly if my life depended on it. And it does. That's the bottom line. We both know what it's about. It's about cockpit resource management. It's about how you handle yourself in the airplane. It's about how you make that decision. And would you expand on that just a little bit on what you consider qualified pilots? Because I'm so damn frustrated about this, this arbitrary figure that we put in out there uh, when it comes to uh, just as long as you have 1,500 hours, you're going to be in, uh, you're going to be good enough to fly. And that's just simply not the case. And now we have a pilot shortage because we don't have um, the folks, as you're talking about, that really have what it takes to, uh, uh, you know, to fly passengers for hire. Um, I'd be very interested in, in you expanding on that. Right. Mr. Bedford. Oh, Mr. Bedford. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, well, I agree with you completely. You know, uh, arbitrary rules are very generally unproductive. And, and to clarify, Republic's not in support of any repeal of FAR 117. Uh, so I am. <laughs> Well, look, I believe crew members do need adequate west rest, and we should all play by the same rules. Uh, having said that, again, uh, training is the quality of training takes precedent over the quantity of, of flight time. And I think to answer your question in terms of military time, we don't see, I certainly understand why military pilots receive the best training in the world, and they perform at a high and proficient level, even with limited flight time. Those pilots aren't coming, though, into the industry. We talk about potential military pilots coming in, and, and potentially a guy who's landing a, a fighter on a carrier coming out with 300 hours is still considered unqualified to fly under the current statute. It's crazy. We're going to ask that guy to now go get another 500 hours of flight time flying in a single-engine airplane in a fair-weather environment before we can consider him a candidate. There's only 24 universities that have been approved, as far as I know. Maybe there's been a few more added since then. None of them are two-year aviation program, so the reduction to 1,250 hours is, is, is a farce. It doesn't even exist. There's no way to take advantage of that. So uh, again, you know, we had a rulemaking process. The industry, including uh, you know, the ALPA, were on the same page on this. It was simply ignored uh, by the FAA. I would urge this, this subcommittee to strongly uh, ask the FAA to reconsider how it implemented the rule. And I'm only talking about the, uh, the uh, experience requirements and not the flight and duty time limitations. Um, so, uh, again, I think we should be focused on quality and capability and proficiency. Uh, and again, if there's an airline out there that is putting non-qualified, although they may be statutory qualified, but they're not proficient, not professional, not safe, and I think that's what we had at Colgan, those airlines have no business being in, in the industry. Mr. Moak, real quick. Congressman Graves, you're an accomplished pilot. I uh, flew off aircraft carriers, flew fighters off aircraft carriers. We have... Uh, the best training, some of the best training in the world, where they're coming out with 250 hours and they're flying our, uh, our young men and women in the combat overseas. Uh, so what you focused on is a very good point. Training and oversight after training. I believe what the committee had done and what the uh, process led to uh, was a uh, proxy for, uh, with hours uh, as a uh, substitute for some training. As you know, before, there were people that were coming in with very reduced hours, uh, getting an ATP and going right into uh, the right seat of these airlines, some at very reduced wages. That's what was trying to be uh, corrected here. 
but your focus on training is spot on. I'm with you uh, on training, and we need to stay vigilant on training. You could have 2,000 hours or 20,000, like you said, without proper oversight, without proper training. It's not a safe operation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks to each of you for being here today. Uh, I'd like to first start with uh, Mr. Moat. Um, thanks again. Good to see you again. You propose restoring loan guarantees for college students undergoing, undergoing flight training programs. Uh, this is a concept that really interests me. I have Parkland Community College in my district, and under the leadership of, of their president, Tom Ramage, a good friend of mine, uh, they're going to assume control of the aviation program that was once at the University of Illinois. We want to uh, continue to explore ways and policies that will help uh, future pilots succeed. What other innovative means do you think could be employed to recruit students interested in becoming pilots? You know, we have, we have Congressman, we have the same challenges uh, that's confronting, uh, you know, STEM in the United States. We need to stay focused on getting uh, young men, and I want to emphasize women, into our, uh, into our profession. And the Airline Pilots Association, we're partnering with universities and pushing this hard, but we, we're being very mindful of the cost of education today. Uh, the future is going to be on uh, these young people going through, graduating, and then progressing to a job and a career. And so anything that we can do in that respect, uh, anything this committee can do or the Congress can do, uh, we're all for. Well, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bedford, you mentioned just in your last question, in your last response, about our, our military members, our, our service members can fly hours upon hours, mission upon mission, uh, land uh, multi-million dollar aircraft on aircraft carriers, and they have to come back and get 500 more hours of certification, did you say? It depends, on, it depends on how many hours, Congressman, they actually leave the military with. But yes, it's possible for a highly proficient military pilot to leave the service with less than 750 hours, and he would be required under statute to make up the difference before he would be eligible for a restricted ATP. On, on average, I mean, how often does that happen? I think today we're seeing very few military pilots actually coming into the commercial airline business. So one of the challenges we have is the you know, commercial airline business is a seniority-based uh, opportunity. And, and as uh, a previous congressman had mentioned, you know, people come into the profession looking at it as a career investment. And that career starts with building experience at, at regional carriers, and then they generally matriculate to mainline. And that's the same path that most military pilots would take as well. Okay. Well, I'm interested. Now, you, you brought up a very interesting point that I didn't expect and wasn't on my prepared list of questions. Um, I'd be happy to work with you and the others on the panel to try and address that issue so that our, our heroes can come back and, and fill this, this air, uh, airline pilot shortage. Uh, Mr. Springer, uh, while I have some time left, uh, you did start to talk a little bit about the contract tower program. I have uh, numerous contract towers in my district in central Illinois. And, you know, you, you, you got into it a little bit, but can you tell me how the contract tower program helps you retain your, your air service and, and also how it promotes safety? <clears throat> sure, uh, Congressman. Uh, without the contract tower program, we would not have a tower. Uh, and if we didn't have a tower, our airlines would uh, struggle to operate at our airport uh, with the frequency and, and, and that they currently have. We would not have grown to the point where we are without the contract tower program. Uh, when we look at uh, the, the struggles that we are at now is that the contract tower program isn't built for scale. And so as an airport grows larger, we're still at the scale of a much smaller airport. One more question for you, Mr. Springer. I know you have experience with the Small Community Air Service Development Program and coming up with your local contributions. Uh, from your testimony, I gather that the local buy-in is a key component to your success. And what, if any, changes would you recommend to make that program more effective for airports like you to use? The key, I think, is exactly what you said, Congressman. It has to have local contribution and buy-in. If the community isn't behind it and supportive of it, uh, 
it, it's going to be a difficult struggle altogether. Uh, when the community does have the buy-in and is participating financially, they have a vested interest in its success. Well, thank you. And one last question. Mr. Mann, according to an MIT report released last year, domestic departures declined by more than 21 percent at small airports between 07 and 2012, but less than 9 percent at our large hub airports during the same period. What do you think, why do you think there is such a large discrepancy between the large and the small airports? Is it just price or what other, what other uh, what ideas? It's primarily uh, a price and the nonstop destinations uh, and the fact that it's so easy for people in our community to drive to the larger airports. Charlotte is, like I said, the sixth largest airport in the country. It's just over an hour drive away and uh, they, they're just a tough competitor. I think uh, our, what we need to do in the local community though is get our costs in line and uh, make a business case to the airlines to serve our market. And uh, I can tell you, our example is, we, when we got the more, more service um, and got our costs in line, the airlines did pr bring capacity back and we started uh, seeing the customers come back to our airport. So uh, again, I think it's, it, for us it comes back to local, local control and having a willing airline that's uh, willing to take a risk with us. Well, thank you. If I had more time, Mr. Chairman, I'd yield back. And then Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank each of you. Some of you, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Uh, Mr. Mann, let me start with you. I had the pleasure of flying into your airport here just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I have a good friend in Asheville who sends his regards, uh, Lou. Uh, you, it has been talked about that you created competition or allowed for some additional competition among uh, carriers. It, one, is that the case? How did you do that, and how did it benefit, I guess, uh, the, you know, the airport and the community there? Well, primarily, it, it was, again, getting our costs in line and then making a business case uh, for the new air service. It, it, it really came down to the fact we were not competitive, and uh, so, so we, had, we had to go out to both airlines after we got our costs in line. One of the things that, uh, that we saw with Delta, and we made the business case when, it, when it's encru encouraging competition, we, we made a case to Delta that if you are going to drive, uh, if our customers, five, half, our, half our market drives to Charlotte, if, if those guys are going to drive to Charlotte, they're, they're going to get on U.S. Airways and American Airlines. And so Delta, you're going to lose all those customers. And so we were able to quantify what that loss would be. And if they, again, just added a little bit of capacity at a, a fairly competitive price, that they would pick up that market share and fill the planes up. Um, they agreed to do so, and they're running about an 84, 85 percent uh, load factor in our market. But again, it was it was making a business case with with Delta Airlines primarily that uh, if if you bring the aircraft here, you can make money in our market. And uh, they're again to date, they are very happy with uh, with with what they're doing in our market. And again, it's, it has not hurt U.S. Airways in Charlotte. I mean, those folks were were on the road. Um, and now they have an option to fly out of the local community. And uh, again, that's that's a win-win for economic development, the folks that don't have to spend that hour and a half on the road. And uh, again, the airline can still make money in our market. So I, I really think it comes down to making a business case. And again, Delta had not really thought about the fact that they were gonna lose, that they were just losing market share by, by not adding, we're, we're talking 100 seats a day. Um, very simple to fill that up when you have 500,000 people driving up the road. All right, so let me go on in terms of the competitiveness uh, and, and let's talk a little bit about unfunded mandates and about compliance costs and what happens because it seems like there's a, a plethora of uh, uh, compliance issues that come up and it, they expect uh, both you, Mr. Springer, and you, Mr. Mann, to figure out ways to implement those and, and that would go at the expense of operational expenditures and capital expenditures to meet those compliance things. How do we how do we best deal with that and how do we control that in terms of those additional unfunded mandates that have been placed on small and rural airports? The, the most recent challenge we had was the uh, with the TSA wanting to get out of the excellent lane business. Um, that was that was going to be a significant hit to our bottom line, and uh, we had already put technology in place um, to handle that. And so it was it was a, it was an issue out there where if if they would have just accepted the technology um, for for that exit lane, it wouldn't have it was an unfunded mandate potentially, um, but we couldn't get we couldn't get the TSA to accept the technology. So I, I think airports are trying to be creative. We're trying to do smart things out there, um, and our regulatory bodies um, are putting up roadblocks for us. And, and my point is we have enough challenges that when, when we find solutions, 
we need, we need partners in, in the FAA and the TSA to work with us and say, yes, we think that can work. What, make it a pilot program if you need to, but, but that's, that's really where, where we need to go. The other part is uh, the regulations on airport revenue, parking lot revenue. We ought, to be, we ought to have the flexibility to use that local revenue to do what we think is in the best interest of our, our local economy. So the revenue use policy to have greater flexibility there in, in terms of how to implement that. That, that, is, that would be key, also the land use, but uh, yes, the revenue use policy really is antiquated. It, it needs to be modified, and, and again, let, let us in the community do what's best with our airline partners and our community uh, to grow the business. So what you're saying is, is that you came up with a few options with regards to TSA that uh, would not sacrifice safety and uh, could have been a more cost efficient, uh, efficient way to implement it and yet you couldn't get a sign off from TSA to do that. That is correct. So um, how often does that occur? Uh, well, not specifically just with TSA but with any federal agency. It, it, it happens all the time. I mean with our, rev with our revenue use policy, I mean daily. Um, if we wanted to do an airline incentive right now, uh, which we didn't need, to, we did not need to do in Columbia, but if we wanted to, we could not have used our money to partner with a specific route, a specific airline. Uh, there's just, there's just complications that are there that, again, prohibit us from being uh, more successful than what we would be. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Larson for five minutes. Dr. Dillingham, um, what would you see as a key contributing factor to the growth in the total and the per passenger EAS subsidies as a result of your report? Mr. Larson, <clears throat> I think that uh, the fact that there are the increased number of uh, communities that are a part of EAS, uh, that certainly is a major factor. The other factor is something that the other panelists mentioned in terms of the the price of, of fuel has quadrupled over the last several years, which also contributes to the, the, uh, the subsidy cost as well. So those two factors are the key factors that, that contribute to the increase in cost. Would, the, would, the, uh, would this, the fuel be a, more of a contributor to the per passenger then? The yes, per sir. Yes, subsidy? Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, Secretary. Um, uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, two other factors that I, I would like to mention is that what we have seen in the past few years, a number of EAS carriers have gone out of business. So the pool has become smaller in terms of the available carriers. We're also seeing a lot of the equipment, uh, the 19 to 34 seat aircraft, were, which were, have been essentially the right sized aircraft for these co uh, communities, aging and being retired. And so the finding the types of aircraft that are going to work has posed challenges as well and additional expense. So on that point, what's the challenge in finding the, uh, the right size aircraft at this point? Well, they're not, um, the manufacturers are not making the 19 to 34 seaters. So what we're seeing, and Congress did uh, rela uh, change some of the requirements to allow nine seaters. And we're seeing in, in many of the communities with, with the shorter haul flights, the nine seaters are working well. In other larger communities, uh, the 50 seat reg RJs are, are working, but we still we we they're, but they are more expensive to run as well. So we don't necessarily have the sweet spot at this point for the type of aircraft. All right. So I have one more question for Secretary Kerland. It's uh, the issue was brought up earlier, but uh, and unrelated to the rural and uh, rural service, but it has to do with the NAI application. Can you tell the subcommittee uh, where DOT is in the process on the NAI application? Uh, Congressman, as you know, it's a contested proceeding, and so I'm not at liberty to comment on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Um, I have a couple more questions for the panel that I wasn't able to get to during my time period, and I'd like to start with Secretary Curlin. I, I, I will remind you, I, I do not have any other committee action going on that I'm going to ask you about today like last time. So uh, I, I just want to actually get your opinion. I, I, mentioned, uh, I, I mentioned in the SCA SDP program, we had a little uh, somewhat of a discussion uh, earlier during my questioning. Um, I appreciated your responses. But Secretary Curlin, can you tell me how important is community involvement for this program? And can you give me some ideas of how 
uh, airports can effectively work with IDOT or work with USDOT even more so to make it easier for you to make a determination? Um, thank you, Congressman, and I appreciate your comments. Um, the, the SCASDAP program, and, and as both of our airport managers have mentioned, and I, and, I, and I compliment them on the great work they've done at their airports, have mentioned the importance of community involvement. And we have seen that um, many of the successful programs have had uh, community in, uh, involvement. Um, in, in we, we view that as a very high priority where the communities are putting skin in the game because that means that they're going to support the service. If it's a revenue guarantee, they're going to use the service. So that type of support um, is critical. Uh, the other thing that, one of the other things that we have learned from some of the uh, other uh, reports and uh, that, you know, the GAO, the, the IG has done and that we've taken a look at ourselves is the important importance before, for example, we issue a revenue guarantee that a, a feasibility st study is done so that the airport, as much as possible, sets themselves up for success. Um, and so we, we think that th those types of things are important. We've also recently, in, the, in, um, in our recent uh, RFPs, put in a, an opportunity for intermodal funding to the extent that a community was interested in looking at that uh, as well. Um, so, but I would like to commend Congress in taking in, in, in the in the, in the funding of the SCASDAP program and viewing it as a laboratory, as giving these communities, these airports, an opportunity to try new and different things. But community support is really critical. Great. Thank you. Dr. Dillingham, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes. Uh, just a footnote to that is that uh, DOT is, is maintaining uh, a database of sort of lessons learned from the small community program which has benefited communities that are thinking about these innovative approaches, what works, why it works, and, and what they need to do to be more successful. So we think that's a good thing for uh, improving the, the effectiveness of the small community program. Great. Does anybody else on the panel have uh, any other comments they'd like to make on the small community program? Well, just from my own experience, Congressman Davis, uh, community involvement is essential, um, and communities should have skin in the game, economic skin in the game, in order to make sure that they're doing everything that they can to support uh, unique air carrier services. Uh, I agree with everything that uh, Secretary Curlin said with the, the challenges of finding the right aircraft. I think you referred to it as the sweet spot, uh, something that, you know, frankly, passengers want cabin class service, you know, and like it or not, there is a certain turboprop avoidance factor. But the one thing that hasn't been mentioned here today that I think I should at least put on the table is just airport crowding in general. Uh, what these services need is connectivity to the nation's transportation network. There's rarely enough traffic, you know, from small town community to small town community. So being able to make connections in large hubs is essential for the service to be successful, which means small communities need to partner with major airlines. The pushback you get is a small airplane consumes the same amount of airspace as a wide body. So, you know, you were competing for scarce resources in places like Atlanta and Chicago and New York and Philadelphia, you know, San Francisco, L.A., and that, that's, that's a huge problem, I think, uh, well, one of many that face the, the retention of these vital air links in smaller communities. Right. Well, the hearing's about to end. Does anybody on the panel have any issues you'd like to discuss that we might not have gotten to. Now's your time to, to go ahead and do that. Did I mention going the pilot shortage? <laughs> <laughs> going once, going twice. If there are no further questions, I thank the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their participation. The subcommittee stands adjourned.